I am, I'm running one of these trench burn pits that I do, and I really like this system a lot. And as you can see, there's a lot of white ash that's forming um, on there. And I actually ran off to the house to do something. I got back kind of late, and then I just had to delete some files from my camera to record this. So it's way past where I would prefer to be adding um, wood, so it's making uh, quite a bit of ash. But anyway, um, people have pointed out that this method looks like it produces a lot of ash, as well as the open burn piles that I do. So I wanted to talk about why I like these methods and put that in context, because context is king. And compare it to some of the other options that are out there and the situations that people find them in, like the different situations and the situation that I'm in and why that matters. So I'm going to add some wood to this before I make too much more ash because, of course, the, the purpose is still to make as much charcoal as possible. And then we'll talk about that. So I got some wood on this pit and it's actually getting to the point where it needs maintenance again, but whatever. I want to talk for a minute about um, context and different methods of making biochar and the efficacy or inefficacy or efficiency or inefficiency of this and other methods. And context, 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 context is king. And I wanted to address that and tell you why I like these methods so much and compare them to some of the other options that are available out there that I, that I know of. Now, I may not know of all the methods out there and you're welcome to, you know, enlighten me to what those are if there's other possibilities or any thoughts related to this from your perspective because my perspective is you know just is what it is and i can only extrapolate and put try to put myself in other people's shoes and in their situations to um, understand why they use the methods they use or make the decisions they make or how those methods and situations compare to mine so the reason I like these methods in a nutshell is they got me from thinking about making biochar to making biochar. I just burned this trench full of charcoal. I'm probably going to add one more layer of wood and then I'll quench it and put it out and it'll be probably close to 100 gallons of charcoal. Usually this trench full is about 100 gallons, even a little bit more. And when I look around here and here, it looks like I barely put a dent in the amount of wood that I have to burn this year. I burned one open brush pile in this and I still have, it's looking like at least five more trenches and at least two more, you know, brush piles worth of, of stuff. So for me, um, this is largely about getting it done. Like what can I get done? Now let's examine this and compare it to other methods. So one of the, the common complaint about this, I think, is that it produces too much ash. So let's compare that to some other methods and what they entail and and whether or not we can get them done like just for me even with these simple like low input methods they require a fair amount of time but compared to a lot of other methods they don't necessarily but even for me to get these simple things done um, you know with other stuff to do and i'm running out of burn season like before we know it these grasses are going to seed then they're going to start to dry out and it's going to get hot and dry and i won't be able to burn at all anymore so these are the methods i'm familiar with that we could compare to um, there's traditional charcoal kilns, which could either be a mound of earth or like a, a beehive shaped structure or something like that. And those work in a similar way. So they require a similar amount of um, maintenance and burning time and stuff like that. They produce a harder charcoal and they probably produce less, a lot less ash. Um, I'm not really sure. I've done similar methods and had a fair success with them like burning in pits with like a cover or in a barrel and stuff like that but they do take a long time and a fair amount of maintenance so sometimes they're like multi-day campaigns you know where you're burning charcoal and someone has to stay up and watch the fire or get up periodically and check the fire so in terms of time input it's way more time input and in terms of energy input to set it up, it's probably more as well. It's definitely more if you're going to build a clamp, which is a, a stack of a neatly stacked stack of wood that's covered with earth. If you have a kiln, that's fine, but you need to load it with similar sized pieces of wood and load them in carefully and pack it pretty well. So that's a bunch of work too. Uh, will you get more wood? Maybe, but weigh it against all those other things and whether you can get it done. Can you afford to get up in the middle of the night a couple of times to check your kiln? Um, you know, is it is that worth it if you don't need that high quality hard charcoal 
that's good for like blacksmithing and smelting and other industrial applications. I'm gonna say probably for most of us not. This is much more accessible and accessibility is really what it's all about at this point to me. Like how can we make biochar accessible to as many people as possible so that it's like easy to produce and they're actually gonna produce it and get a pile of it and get it in the ground and start using it. Another method is like using a retort. So imagine if you had a, a one container that's basically sealed or it has just some small holes or it might even have a pipe coming out of it for gases as it builds up gases inside, but it's mostly sealed. Then you put the wood you wanna turn into charcoal in that and then you heat that wood with more wood. So let's say you put that small cylinder of, of wood that's gonna be charcoal into a bigger cylinder that's full of wood, like surround the inner cylinder with wood, light that off, burn it, and it heats the wood inside enough to cause it to pyrolyze and turn into charcoal. And then the gases that are driven off, they go out small holes or they might go out a pipe and you can burn those gases. So the wood is partially helping to burn itself, but it requires wood to get that wood hot enough to do that. So right off there, you have a bunch of ashes produced because all the wood in the outside barrel gets burned, burned up and used up in the process. So if you're doing that, um, the, the possible advantages are you get a different kind of charcoal. Again, you get a harder charcoal. And so I've heard people you know, say that that's better and I've heard people say that that's worse. I don't know who to believe. I'm not, I'm not gonna waste my time looking into it because at this point for me, this is what it's all about because it's accessible. It's accessible. I can produce hundreds of gallons of charcoal easily this way. And if the other charcoal's better, like you're gonna have to prove to me that that charcoal is a lot better. I mean, you're, you're gonna have to pull out some heavy information <laughs> to convince me to take this wood have to cut it up into similar sized pieces, carefully pack it into a cylinder, and then waste a bunch more wood, burning that wood to heat the inner wood to turn it into better charcoal. Okay, you see what I mean? So there's a lot of, that just raises a lot of questions and I don't know the answers to those questions, but like I said, you know, from my perspective, you're gonna have to sell me pretty hard on doing that. Now another method is called the T-LUD, and I think the T-LUDs are really cool. It's, it means top lit um, updraft. So I don't wanna explain exactly how it works, but it's um, most of them are like a barrel full of chips. You light them at the top, they burn down from the top, but the air comes from the bottom. So the air gets used up in the burn zone, and then the, the what passes through the charcoal on top that's already finished since you lit it at the top, are inert gases, like the oxygen gets used up. So the charcoal on top, you, you build up a layer of charcoal on top until it reaches the bottom, and then you quench it and put it out. As far as I know, I haven't even used these methods yet. I mean, I have some barrels here that have been sitting for a few years waiting for me to, to build one of these things. Um, I still do want to though. But um, I think there's probably very little ash produced and you're not using extra fuel. So that's really cool, but you need similar sized pieces. I can't take this brush and these chunks of limbs and the kind of stuff that I have, pack them into, just pack them into a barrel. I have to start cutting them up. So these systems are good for like little chunks of wood and wood chips and stuff like that. Okay, so let's say we just, say, let's just say, okay, the tea lot is more efficient than this. It's producing less ash, which mine's producing a lot of ash. So I gotta go maintain it, I'll be right back. Anyway, I'm trying to remember where we were. I think we were at, at T LUDs and looking. Okay, let's just say that the T LUD is more efficient than the pit or the open pile, which it probably is in terms of in terms of efficiency of turning wood into charcoal, like getting more charcoal out of the process. But it's important with any design. A very common mistake with design is to um, focus narrowly on one or two or a few parameters at the expense of everything else. And that's where I'm saying that context is king, right? So again, am I gonna get it done in the first place? Um, what do I have to put in to make it happen? Now, if you live near town and you can get endless supplies of wood chips, or maybe the, the tree people come and dump wood chips at your house, or there's a pile somewhere that you can just go shovel into your truck, well, that's one thing, but what would I have to do to do a T-LUT design? I'd have 
to like take all these small limbs and cut them into little tiny pieces to fill a barrel full of them with what an axe a saw um, I don't know what or I'd have to build or get a chipper to make the chips in order to run the tea lead so if I look at it that way you know for me it's all about how to burn the stuff that I have which is brush it's mostly limbs um, some other random stuff lumber rotten wood things like that but most of its limbs so I take a limb off the tree I want to do like a minimal amount of processing to that and then turn it into charcoal with very little effort and getting a reasonable amount of charcoal out of it so let's say like if we look at it that way like what percentage of loss to ash then becomes acceptable you know it changes the way that that we look at what's acceptable in terms of our production and turning wood into charcoal because or or into ash because i can look up here and i just have endless forest that needs maintenance you know i've got um dozens and dozens and dozens of trees that need to come out and then I have to deal with them. I have to get them processed. So I want to knock those limbs off, take the bigger stuff and bring it to the pit if I can, or burn it on site in a pit, and then take the more tangly stuff with like lots of limbs and leaves and stuff sticking out, pile those up and burn them in these open piles. So for me, again, like what would I have to do? How much would I have to spend to get a really, you know, a real chipper shredder that's going to handle limbs, you know, that are four inches in diameter? and handle a lot of them like what am i gonna have to pay for that or to rent it i've looked into renting it's like 400 bucks a day or something to rent those things you could rent them for a week and it's you know cheaper by the day but it's still a lot of money and then i'm pumping in fossil fuels so a lot of people tout um, biochar as a way to sequester carbon and basically make up for greenhouse gas emissions because you're you're pulling you know the trees are pulling carbon out of the air you're turning into charcoal and then so 50 percent of the carbon that the tree pulled out of the air you're making into charcoal and sequestering it permanently in the soil but you're going to use fossil fuels to get that wood chipped up in order to you know sequester that carbon that doesn't really make any sense either so i don't know there's probably a place for all of these things but it's all about context so the other thing is i don't know how efficient or inefficient these methods are you know i would guess that they're less efficient than a t-lud i could almost be sure of that like i feel pretty confident in that assessment but i don't know and i don't know how efficient they are until someone does careful trials about exactly you know how efficient they are and that's probably not going to be me because i don't really give a damn i've got all this wood, I don't have time to think about it. I don't have time to come up with like better improved methods. I don't feel like I need to. You know, if you live in sub-Saharan Africa or some kind of deforested place or even in your backyard in the city, wherever you are that wood is limited, you may want to be thinking about maximizing the amount of charcoal that you can get out of that wood. What I want is to maximize the amount of charcoal I can produce in a season by some method that I can actually get done. And that it, these methods just seem to fit that bill really well. So there's my thoughts on the subject and you know all these the other options that are available. I think they're all cool, they're all interesting. I think eventually we're gonna be producing, we're gonna have wood stoves that produce this you know, automatically as a, as a rule. And there's already like biochar cook stoves. So people in third world countries or anywhere that cook um, over fire can be using, you know, like a high efficiency stove that's going to really produce, you know, cook, cook food efficiently, but then also produce charcoal at the same time uh, for farming and gardening purposes. So all kinds of interesting stuff is bound to happen and show up and um, be developed. But for now, to me, I can, what I can see out there is, is people have the same problem I had and they need accessible methods, like easy accessible methods that you can do at home that you can actually get done when you have a pile of wood without renting a chipper, without owning a chipper, without spending um, huge amounts of time like cutting stuff into small pieces and uh, making it the right size of feedstock for whatever system that you're trying to use. So um, yeah. Yeah, and I, I think probably the truth is that all these methods are going to have their place. It's just a matter of context. I think I've beat that one to death already. So I'm going to get this done, put it out, go on for the rest of my day, and then try to do this every morning until at least 
these, I don't know, man, there's a lot of wood right here. So I'm thinking five or even more um, burns in this trench, just, just right here. We're even, not even counting the stuff I haven't pulled in yet that's all, you know, out of the woods and we, we pulled in. So that's going to be, if this pit's full, it's usually about 100 gallons, even more, uh, depending how full it is. I may or may not fill it up today, but we're looking at 90 to 110 gallons probably in each burn. So five, you know, 500 to 600 gallons of charcoal just sitting here waiting to be made. But I can get that done. I can get that done because it's going to take two hours of my morning um, of not very hard work and then I can get on with my day.